So as we look at this phenomena of physical distancing and social distancing and all of the requirements that we are um, um, uh, required to do these days, we still know that connection is something that we crave even more so. And it seems as if um, our very way of existing, our way of, of being human um, is being challenged. And we're seeing now how important connection really is. And so now we're looking at how do we humanize these um, areas that we're having to engage in? How do we humanize the online environment? Um, how do we humanize being in these um, Zoom sessions? And how do we humanize engaging with students and with one another when we have um, this distance between us, this digital divide that we're dealing with? And so we're, no we're noticing that um, if we focus on um, solidarity and community, it is helping us to um, really walk through these times um, and hopefully we'll be able to look back and remember that we were still able to connect. And in some instances, our connections have grown even deeper. But the question is, how do we maintain this um, as we deal with our students with the understanding of what our students are also experiencing? So this um, brings us to the notion of how do we lead with equity and how do we create a culture that um, is equity minded, that is infused with equity principles and how do we bring this into our daily practice? You all have done great work. Um, your campus is one of those campuses that everyone looks to to see, well, what is, what is SMC doing? Um, because you all have really been at the forefront of um, looking into equity, applying an equity lens to your institutional um, policies, practices, um, and the goal is, I think, for um, us to look at Santa Monica, but then to see how can we not only get there, but then how can we scale that? How can we ensure that regardless of our positionality um, on our campuses, whether we're in financial aid, whether we're in tutoring, whether we're in A&R, regardless of our positionality, are we practicing these principles that we have been learning about and that have um, become a part of our institutional culture? Um, how are we creating um, care and belonging in our everyday practices when we're engaging with our students as well as when we're engaging with each other. So just a quick review of equity. Um, equity is a state or um, a quality of um, being fair and being, an, being impartial. It's also uh, synonymous with justice. And I, I like to believe that social justice, and I operate from a, a, a premise that social justice is at the center, is at the core of equity. And so how do we make sure that um, equity is not something that's you know, a lofty goal, but it's something that's actually attainable? And then how do we um, ensure that we're attaining equity? And so that means that we're looking to place equity-minded principles and practices into um, our structures, into our systems, so that equity can be attained and sustained. Again, you all are doing great work. Um, you have your gender equity center, your racial justice center, your pride center, um, your dream resource center, um, undocumented and dream resource center. And so again, you are um, doing the work and the commitment is reflected in um, how it's being carried out through the institution. Now, with respect to your equity mission, um, 
you are, of course, um, upholding um, equity centered environments that uh, focus on learning and working and ensuring that equity is infused throughout those environments. Um, you're looking at becoming a campus that is inclusive and you're implementing policies and practices um, to ensure that um, inclusiveness is present and that belonging is present, but also um, with respect to your vision, um, being culturally responsive in your educational community. And that is something that is really important because um, oftentimes we focus on equity, but we look at it um, from a numbers standpoint. And we look at how can we look at, how can we um, focus on the students who are falling into these gaps? And what is the work and the activities that can be done in order to prevent students from falling through these gaps? But there's a deeper work that needs to take place. How are we centering these students' needs and looking at what those needs are and being culturally responsive in the process? And it really comes down to applying an equity lens to all areas of the institution and seeing how our students are impacted by our policies and our practices. And then again, applying that equity lens to determine the work that needs to be done in order to fulfill our mission and our goals and our visions. So again, you all are doing a wonderful work around that. And I noticed that um, particularly you've done a lot of work with Q, um, with Dr. Ben Simone, also um, with, um, Luke Woods and that team, as well as um, Veronica, Veronica Neal has come in and um, done a lot of work with you all around um, multiculturalism, but you're also focusing on racial equity as well. So we always like to go back to this notion of equity is um, not about someone else taking your pie or your slice. It is about, um, how do you ensure that students have what they need? But beyond students, everyone in the institution, how do we make sure that things are in place, practices are in place so that everyone feels like that they have the essential ingredients to um, bake their own pie? Leading with care is important, but the question is, how do we do that? How do we lead with care so that we know that our vision and our mission and our values are um, in place, but not only that, the goals that we have set with ourselves, how do we know that those goals are being implemented? Where does it show um, in the work that we do? And where's the evidence of it being successful? And so when we are, um, I love this quote, our society needs to establish a culture, to reestablish a culture of caring um, by Mandela. So how do we lead with care as, um, as educators, as, um, classified professionals? How does that show up in our work? What are some of the practices that we can do when we're engaging with our students, when we're engaging with one another that shows um, and evidences care is at the center of what we do? So some of the practices include um, leading with compassion, um, having empathy, empathetic listening. It means that you're taking a moment to really listen to um, and engaging in the conversation that you're in, but really listening with an open mind and an open heart um, and with a desire to understand what is being communicated rather than uh, oftentimes we are so anxious to give our responses to what we think is being said without taking a moment to just really listen with empathy so that we can um, have a moment of reflection, you know, being intentional in that moment, um, which brings us back to mindfulness, but actively and empathetically listening to um, the communication that's happening in the moment. 
Also asset strength based language. We know that um, um, in the past, a lot of deficit based language has been used when um, communicating about our students. Oftentimes it's not intentional. Oftentimes it's um, labels that we have uh, created that help us to understand um, the demographics that we're dealing with, to help us understand um, the background information that we don't have to speak about that background information. We can just create a label um, or um, a title, but something that will help us to identify who we are referencing without having to look at the background information. But oftentimes we that has been deficit-based. And so um, you all have taken the necessary steps to look at how you language your students and how um, uh, the references that you make to your students are more asset-based. Because with the work that you've done around, um, uh, the work that you've done with Q that has had you looking at um, your policies and practices with um, an equity lens and with a racial um, equity lens, you've been able to zero in on some of the language and some of the terms that have been used to refer to students. And there's been um, a concerted effort to not only look at that language, but to shift it and to change it into more asset strength-based language. Also empowering um, feedback when we're engaging in conversation with one another, um, uh, regardless of the positionality, whether it's um, management and um, employee, um, colleague to colleague, but making sure that the feedback that we give is empowering rather than feedback that um, is more critical. And you can apply a critical eye to what you're um, looking at, but also the feedback that's being provided um, may point to some areas where um, there's some challenges and some areas of improvement, but you're doing this in a way that empowers folks instead of tear, tearing them down and um, being supportive in your supervision. And that is whether you're in a role, in a supervisory role, but also even with um, engaging with students and, and supervising in that moment of um, if you're over a program or if you're engaging with students, how are you being supportive in that role? And what does that look like? What does the language look like? What does the level of engagement look like? And again, are you leading with care and with that being at the center of um, the work that you're doing? Cultural humility is another area. And again, Cultural humility speaks to not um, being, how can I say this, uh, knowing all things, so to speak. A lot of times we uh, come into these situations and we feel like we know cultures, right? Uh, we may consider ourselves to be culturally competent, but there really is no way for you to be competent about my culture or for me to be competent about your culture. There's some things that I can know about your culture and have an understanding of, but there needs to be an approach to different cultures um, that is centered in humility, which means I can never know everything about you and your culture, but I'm willing to learn. And I know that you are more of an expert in your culture. And so it is for me to step back and listen to you and have you teach me about the things that are significant, the things that are important to your culture. So it's bringing this, this, this heart to the work and it's with an understanding that there needs to be humility when we're engaging with one another and understanding each other's culture. The thing about cultural humility is that um, it, it was this, this work was created by two, uh, two doctors out of the Bay Area. And um, um, they happen to be, they're black women. And when, one of the things that they noticed is that in the work that they were doing in the clinics and um, appointments with patients, they noticed that whenever um, 
Black folks or Latinx folks or people of color um, were being asked about um, their conditions or their symptoms or what have you, their experience, there was um, a level of disbelief around um, the information that was being communicated. Whereas when someone, uh, when a patient was white, for instance, then they were looked at as an expert when they were talking about their conditions or what they were experiencing. And so um, people of color, black and brown and, and others from marginalized communities, there was a notion around, um, they didn't know what they were talking about. They weren't smart enough to understand what was going on with their bodies. And so cultural humility, um, the doctors thought that there needed to be um, a shifting in patient care, but from the standpoint of what those in the medical profession, um, the idea and um, um, the mindsets that they brought with them when dealing with certain cultures and looking at a different mindset that seemed to always show up um, when they were engaging with um, white patients. And so the notion was to bring that same level um, of humility and, and, um, and understanding regardless of who the patient was. And so this has been um, also used in education and other fields as well. Looking at the student, um, the person from a different culture, understanding that they are the experts in their own culture and we can learn from them so that we can know how better to serve them. And so moving from cultural humility into a calling in culture, we know that Calling out is the thing of the day, right? Today it's about cancel culture. It's about calling people out, um, but that sets up division. That doesn't indicate care. And so a calling in culture is something that you all have also adopted in your practices. And that is when we're engaging with one another, we understand that there's a difference of opinion. We understand that people have different um, mindsets and ideas around um, different ways of existing in the world. And so if something doesn't necessarily um, uh, feel good in the moment, or if there's an area where there's um, a disagreement around this, there's no need to call someone out. Instead, in order to create a culture that is equity-minded, it is about calling people in saying that we understand that we have differences of opinions, of ways of being, of ways of walking in the world, but that doesn't mean you don't belong here. That just means we have these different ways of being, but we also know that there are some things that we have in common. But even with that, how about we just take a moment to look at um, well, what, why is it that you're saying what you say and help me to understand what it is you feel and what it is you think. And I may not necessarily agree with you. However, um, I can still make sure that you feel like you belong here and that your opinions, your way of being, your way of walking in the world is just as important and valid as mine. And that's the only way we're going to have equity-minded spaces, um, spaces where there's empathetic listening because a calling in culture demands that we have empathetic listening. It demands that we use language that is asset and strength-based and not deficit-based. It demands that we provide empowering feedback and that um, we're there's some humility that is shown when we're engaging with one another. And it also demands that compassion is in the room and empathy is in the room. And so looking at all of this, um, we're looking at equitizing our spaces, humanizing our spaces. And I'd also like to bring in um, the online environment since that's where we are. Because even though we may know how to do this when we're um, around the table with one another and we're um, looking at how we can um, bring these practices in, what does that look like in the online environment?
What does this look like when we know that there's this distance between us, but how are we showing up with compassion and empathy and empathetic listening and our languaging and our feedback? How are we doing this even more so now in the online environment? Belonging, um, I, I focus on the work of, um, let me just take a moment here. How's everyone doing? I just wanna make sure I check in with everyone because sometimes, you know, we can be talking and talking and talking and we don't take a moment to just, you know, be mindful. So is everyone okay? okay? Yes. Okay, any questions so far or any comments? Okay, and feel free to, you know, use the chat as well, you know, to share your thoughts or your feelings around the information that's being presented. Okay, yes, yes. All right, so um, belonging is um, an area I know that you all have had an opportunity to check in with, with Justin, I believe when you, um, that his session focused on belonging as well. I like to always bring belonging into the space. Um, I follow the work of um, John Powell out of the Othering and Belonging Institute at Berkeley. It used to be the Haas Institute, but it was recently renamed uh, the Othering and Belonging Institute. And um, John Powell focuses on the collective we. And I think we're starting to see evidence of that now in society. We just saw that um, with the election that just took place with us um, using um, democracy as a way to um, establish um, and to reflect uh, this notion of a collective we with us all being able to engage in the process is what I mean by that. Regardless of who you supported, it was um, a massive effort with so many millions and millions of people engaging in this process of the collective we. One of the things that John Powell focuses on is that um, um, with belonging, it is about how do we fit into a certain group or how do we fit into a place? And are these spaces that we're trying to belong to, are they welcoming? What is it about these spaces that make us feel like we belong? And more importantly, what is it about certain spaces that um, provide evidence of us not belonging? Right. So what are these relationships that we're engaging in and our communities that we're engaging in and who belongs in these communities and who doesn't, who belongs in these spaces and who doesn't. And so we're all looking at this question of where do we belong? Where do we belong? Um, where do we belong as a culture? Where do we belong um, as cultures within cultures? Right? Um, and how are we made to feel that we belong? He talks about um, belonging and sets it up in a way that you can't really talk about belonging unless you talk about othering. And um, this notion of othering focuses on um, an us versus them mentality, saying that, you know, we're threatened by um, the, those people or um, um, they're um, not necessarily, those folks are not necessarily in agreement um, or don't subscribe to our values and our way of being and belonging. And so as we move um, through these spaces where othering takes place, we see that there are some things that come up. There's the dehumanization, there's bias, there's discrimination, there's prejudice. Um, there is all of the isms that we talk about, racism, ageism, um, um, there's intolerance, there is um, disrespect, and there is um, a level of, um, othering that takes place from time to time where it literally looks like um, certain groups are viewed as the enemy, right? 
even though we can all be in a collective society together, othering sets things up so that those folks over there may be seen as the enemy or trying to take something from us. And so we've got to make sure we protect ourselves, right? So a certain breaking takes place when we have othering. Um, as opposed to belonging, where again, uh, we talk about the collective we. Othering, othering Dr. Uh, Powell says, is the small we, right? That's the small we, but belonging is the collective um, we. And so we know that there are so many instances around um, not belonging and consequences around um, not belonging. One of the things that he talks about is the fact that the opposite of othering is not saning. And what he means by that is oftentimes when we think of um, how do we reach um, others, right? How do we connect with others? How do we make them feel like they are a part of us? And so we have this notion of, we'll just treat everybody like they're the same. If we treat everybody the same, then um, that takes care of othering. Then we've done our job, right? But Dr. Powell says that othering, um, the opposite of othering is not saming, it's belonging. And there's a difference. Treating everyone as the same is really dismissing their cultures, who they are, where they come from. You know, when we say, I don't see race, or that doesn't mean anything to me. Um, I only see you as human. That's wonderful, but you've also have to understand that when we're dismissive of someone's um, culture and ethnicity, um, it's dismissing their history. It's dismissing who they are. And so we do this work around not saming everyone because that's really impossible, but how do we create spaces of belonging so that regardless of where you come from, regardless of what you look like, regardless of what your, um, your body capabilities are, you still belong, regardless of your opinion. He speaks of bridging. I mentioned breaking a little earlier. Breaking is when we are um, moving away from others. We're saying that we need to separate ourselves. But bridging speaks to how can we make sure that th that connection is made and how do we sustain it? Bridging is the thing that builds the path to belonging. It's the reaching out. It's the embracing of who, um, who we are and who others are, right? Um, even though they don't look like us, even though they don't share the same opinions. So this is all a part of um, leading with equity. How are we bridging, not only gaps, but how are we bridging so that we're making connections with one another, that we're creating ties with one another. And it brings us back to leading with care. Because if we're bridging, if we're creating situations where we're building connection, building community, then we're looking at these things that focus on creating a culture of care, the empathetic listening, right? Um, the humility, using all of these characteristics and these practices and being intentional about these practices, going back to mindfulness, um, because the goal is to create belonging, to create inclusive spaces, and bridging helps us to do that. One more thing, I really love um, this image. If you all could take a moment, just drop into the chat what this image means, what it represents to you. I really, I really love this image, and I'm just interested in um, how it lands on you. What does it make you think of? What does it represent to you? What does it represent to you in your work? So if you don't mind, take a moment and do that for me. Then we can all kind of look at that. And... Oh, 
I actually want to travel there and see that when Mother Nature lets us off punishment so we can go outside of the house. And where's the location of that bridge? It's in, um, it's, I think it's in Vietnam. Okay. Thanks. Mm -hmm. I have to look up the exact location, um, but I, I believe it's in um, Vietnam. But it's really beautiful. And it's just a great idea. It's the concept of it. So belonging matters um, with respect to the institution. Um, in all of these areas, the institution, instruction, student services, no matter where we are within the institution, belonging matters. And so the goal is how do we create belonging? How do we create inclusion? Um, how do we create equitized spaces so that no matter who shows up on our campuses, virtually right now. <laughs> um, and when we again get to go back to our campuses, but how does belonging show up? What does that look like? What does inclusion look like? Because we know that all of this matters. When belonging is in place, when these types of practices are in place, um, the, the institution, there's a strong connection with everyone to the institution itself. Students feel welcome and supported. Um, teacher support um, is a very strong predictor with um, creating belonging. And so when we're mindful of this, how does this show up in that area of the institution instruction? And in tutoring, um, how does that show up, right? In that area of the institution. Um, student services, how does it show up in the various areas? Um, even looking at mental health, for instance, we noticed that uh, we know that a lot of our students are, are challenged right now and they're saying that they're stressed, that they're under a lot of pressure, that um, they're depressed, <clears throat> that they feel uncertain, that they're challenged in a lot of ways, financially, um, homelessness, they're challenged in a lot of ways right now. And so what are we doing in our respective areas to address how our students are um, feeling, but also what they're dealing with on a daily basis? And, um, you know, looking at mental health, are we offering online mental health services? Are we referring students to those services so that, um, you know, they have a place to go to speak with someone to help them get through these turbulent times? But overall, when we create equitized spaces that focus on inclusion and belonging, we know that um, overall, the outcomes are more attainable as well as sustainable. So one of the ways that we were dealing with um, uh, looking at society and, and, and trying to make sure that everyone belongs, we've had these various stages, right? Um, first there was exclusion and we still see evidence of that in different areas. But when we move from exclusion to, okay, let's, let's have integration. Let's make it so that everyone is invited to uh, participate in every area of society. And so integration was um, a part of that process. And then moving to inclusion, because we know that even if you have integration, even if you're invited to the table um, or invited to the room, you may not have a seat at the table or even if you're invited to sit at the table, right? You may not be given the same menu as everyone else. So how do we, in every step of the way, look at how we can create belonging so that everyone feels as if they're a necessary and valuable part of the organization, the program, the community, um, the college. And so we move from inclusion 
to this is what belonging looks like. Because if we can see here with respect to exclusion, we know what that looks like. Integration, we let a few folks in. Inclusion, even more. But with belonging, everyone is in, everyone is valued. Everyone is given the support that they need. And um, everyone is an integral part of the institution. So here we're gonna move into um, breakout session number two. And I want us to look at um, where we are in society. Think about what the culture was before. Um, and when we say before, it's like, well, before what? Because now we're gonna be saying like before COVID, after COVID, right? Um, before the pandemic, after the pandemic. Um, but just in terms of all of the things that we've been experiencing as um, a society and as a culture, right? Um, and as a college, what was the culture before? Was it a culture of caring? If so, how was that demonstrated? And now we're looking at how do you see equity, caring, and belonging reflected in this moment in society where we are today? What's different now than where we were before? And then I want you to drill down a little deeper and look at your department, your division, your program, even you, right? How were you before? Now that you've um, been through this moment, we all need the t-shirts, right? We're surviving COVID. <laughs> um, but how, how were you different before? And even looking at our students with all that they've been experiencing, um, how, were you, how were you with them before we were all online as a result of COVID? And then how are you now when engaging with students? So Cyrus? Yes. Would, um, any questions? Let me just ask that before. So we've had an opportunity to look at um, who, who we were before, right? And how we were um, evidencing care before, or where did we feel it was lacking? And looking at, um, you know, how can we move into um, bringing caring and belonging um, and equity mindedness in these practices into um, our everyday practice. So um, you all uh, have had a wonderful equity journey as um, I have mentioned before, but one of the things that I know, and it, this, this always comes up is, how do we do it? We see it in, in print. We see the documents. We've read the vision statements and the mission statements and things of that nature. And it looks great on paper, but how do we do this? And even when we have information and, and, and details around you know, ways to implement these practices and ways to bring them to life, so to speak, and bring them off of the page, what does that really look like in our daily practices? What does that really look like in our programs? Um, what is authentic communication and cultural humility? And what type of high impact practices? And how are we being culturally responsive? How is equity um, demonstrated in a way that shows is at the center of everything that we do? So we know that we have the vision, right? And you all, I'm of course assuming that you um, are familiar with your um, equity vision and mission as well as um, the vision, mission and goals of the college. But my question, then these are the goals and the areas um, where the work is being done so that the vision and the mission can be realized. So my question is, um, how do our students know that we're doing all of this? How is it being reflected? And how are they feeling right now? 
And are they seeing evidence of this? We mentioned um, from the breakout session that there's um, sometimes there's a gap. Sometimes we notice that in addition to the gaps that we know that um, our students are experiencing, there are other gaps that we um, deal with. And one of those gaps is the gap between um, vision, mission, goals, and execution. And even if we have execution, um, what does the implementation look like? And then where is the evidence? How can we measure it? How, what can I point to specifically that says, oh yeah, 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 there, yeah, this is where we're doing this, right? This is where the mission is reflected. This is where the vision is, re is reflected. Um, we can see this throughout the work that we do in our programs, right? We can see it in our policies, but we can also see it in the everydayness of what we do. Um, so the question is, what does it look like for our students? Because students are saying that their circumstances have changed. They're saying that they're overwhelmed. They're saying that their routines have been lost that there's unanticipated cost and over communication, that they're in limbo, they feel disconnected, they feel like they're on their own and they are stressed out. And this is what your students are saying. So the question becomes, if you know what your students are experiencing based upon their own words, and this is as a result of COVID, but one of the things that I can also share with you is that a lot of these students were feeling like this before COVID. They're just more vocal about it now. And also we're showing interest in how they're feeling now because it's impacting us. And we know that we've got to make the necessary shifts in order to address these, these challenges and these experiences that our students are going through. So, the information is not new, it's been there. We just haven't been asking them. And even when we have asked, have we really done the work to address the challenges that they've shared with us? How do we do this? So listening to our students' voices in the learning pandemic, uh, learning during the COVID-19 pandemic, those um, 10 students that mention how they're feeling and what they're experiencing, what are some of the things that we can do in our daily practice to eliminate these things? What are some of the ways that we can lead with care, right? What does that look like? If we're leading with care, if we're bridging instead of breaking, because remember with bridging, right? We're, the goal for bridging is to reach a space of belonging, a place of belonging, is to move from othering to belonging. The things that these, that's showing up, that these students are feeling, a lot of this is also, they, they're experiencing being othered, right? And a lot of them experience this every day. So if we're about equity, how are we demonstrating that? What's the execution? What's the implementation? Where's the evidence? So let's take, how much time do we have? Do we have at least five minutes? It's not a lot of time, but um, maybe we can do this. Instead of going to um, a breakout, let's just talk about it here. And we can put it in the chat, right? And we can just take a moment and discuss it here. But the goal is to look to see how can we move from that abstract concept of equity and inclusion? How can we move from that into action? And how can we show evidence of that? With that, how do we show that we care? How is that demonstrated? How are we bridging? instead of breaking, because breaking is creating more of what those students say that they're experiencing. So how do we move from othering to belonging in our daily work, in our um, departments, in our programs, in our respective areas? Let's talk about that for a moment. 
And then how are you going to, you know, do this in, um, we're in an online environment now, at least I'm thinking until probably to dare I say 2022, because there's talk that even fall of 2021, we may not be back. Not sure. But regardless of where we are and where we'll be in the next year or so, how are we going to address this in our respective areas? And I'll stop sharing so that we can all see each other. And so Faribi doesn't have to remind me. <laughs> My best friend. <laughs> so let's talk about that for a moment. Are y'all okay with doing it this way? Putting in the chat and then just having this conversation? Are you comfortable with that? And I could also pause the recording as well too at this point. Yeah, would you? I yeah. think that would be a great idea. Facilitate the sharing. Yeah.